Sicily 2, we are finally ready to get started. I've been setting this up and sort of refreshing myself on the rules for the past couple days. Very excited to dive in, haven't played OCS in a while. Um, so let's describe the situation we've got. Obviously, this is the Allied invasion of Sicily in, during World War II. Um, you can see that uh, some of the landings have already taken place. A lot of these units are going to get to move. Uh, as soon as we're done with some of the uh, very first things you need to do in this game, you've got Italian coastal defense units here, here, as well as some inland forces um, sort of in this mountainous terrain. Allies essentially are trying to push up, and the most important thing that they're trying to do is capture all of the ports all around the island. As soon as they do that, the game is over. And that's important because they want to end the game as soon as possible for a number of reasons that I will explain. Uh, you've got the Commonwealth landing down here in the uh, Golfo di Noto. Uh, you've got, there's a couple of airdrops uh, that we were going to have to roll for to see if they land on target, but they've targeted here with the um, 82nd Airborne, excuse me, the 82nd Airborne here and the uh, first Airborne uh, of the Commonwealth. So what are, you, what are both sides trying to achieve? Well, the Allies, like I said, trying to capture all the ports. They have a lot of ground they need to make and they have not a lot of time to do it. Points are gonna be scored in this game for a number of things. And at the end of the game, whoever has, uh, Allies want low points, Germans want high points. Whoever is sort of on the, other, on the right side of that divide is gonna win the game. You can see these blue cubes that I've marked uh, up here. It's um, uh, Catania, Palermo, and uh, that is Messina up there. So uh, on specific turns, on turn four and turn nine, it looks like, um, we are going to check to see how much progress the Allies have made. The important thing is, is that the Allies need to be occupying Catania and Palermo both on those check turns to not take a victory point penalty. Now they can do better if they get beyond uh, Catania specifically and get within range of Messina by those turns, they will actually uh, score points in their favor, so they will get negative points. Uh, but that is not a lot of time to do it. The Allies basically have four turns uh, to get to both of these ports, uh, and they've got a long way to go, especially the Americans who are going to want to be driving up the center of the island, especially along this highway is probably the path of least resistance. But as you can see, an Italian HQ blocking the way, and I'm sure they will be moving some units around to uh, to try and stop them. You've also got some forces scattered out here in the west, and those will need to be dealt with because obviously there are ports, but there are also some German units here as well as some uh, air power that's going to have to be taken care of. And if the Allies capture those airfields, the units will have have to rebase if not outright destroyed so they're going to want to do that the more points ports that the allies capture the more places they can bring in more units and more supply and as we all know from my last video supply is critical in this game it is doubly critical because most ocs games have you roll on a table every turn to see how much supply arrives in this game there is no such thing all of the supply is going to be shipped in either from tunisia or for the germans shipped in from italy um, and there's a limited amount of uh, supply that uh, that can be shipped in every turn. For the Allies, it's eight supply points. For the Axis, it's four supply points. Uh, so it's going to be very tight. They need, we need to be really efficient and tight with our actions, especially with the Allies, because they're going to be primarily the attacking force, whereas the, the Axis can kind of take, take a defensive position and make the Allies come to them. Now, how are the other ways you get points? The Axis also get points if they're able to get units across the ferries up here in Messina to mainland Italy. They don't want to do that all at once because then it just leaves the Allies open to take the island. So they've got to strike a fine balance between holding the Allies back, trying to score some of these points, and getting some of these units across back to the mainland. And that's important because they also score points based on when the game ends. You can see here there's a victory point score. The longer the game goes, the more points the Germans score when the game finally ends. So like I said, they're trying to find that balance between getting units over to Italy for game end scoring, but also keep the game going as long as possible so they can get some bonus points. It's a, high, it's a, it's a tight rope that they need to walk, and uh, so it should be pretty interesting to see what they decide to do. The other way the Axis can score points is if you look down here, you've got a huge group. Uh, these, these are big stacks. I don't know if you can tell, but yeah, there we go. You've got a huge group of naval units for, for the Allies. Uh, these are these aircraft carriers in here. That's what these Commonwealth air units are at the bottom. Uh, but they've also got destroyers and cruisers. They are going to uh, be able to bombard co the coast with their artillery value. Uh, and the Axis are going to want to try and sink or damage these because they will also score points at the end of the game for uh, Allied naval units that have been hit. So that's the stakes. That's where we are. You can see that the Allies have overwhelming air power up here. 
up here. The Axis, before the game started, they uh, rolled to see which of their aircraft are active versus inactive, and they actually rolled pretty poorly. The Italians rolled fine. You've got Italian aircraft here, and then some of these airfields and stacks have inactive aircraft under them. But the Axis only rolled two, so they've only actually got two planes ready for this phase. One of them's here in red, and that one actually needs to be fighter swept before I do these airdrops. Um, and they've also got some air uh, off map up here. You can see uh, off map our, uh, Italian air. Um, I believe, yeah, this is this one's Italian, this one's German. So the two German aircraft are there, and there's an F-190, uh, FW-190 down here. So the Allies are going to really have to dominate the air game as well. Um, they're probably going to want to uh, bombard some of these airfields um, if they're more than level one or capture them at the very least uh, and take out these um, air airplanes as quickly as possible. Push back the air net of the Axis uh, as far back towards mainland Italy as possible. And they have the force to do that. The other consideration for the Allies, they've got all these reinforcements sitting out on boats off the coast of the island that can only be brought in with landing craft. Let's take a closer look here. So I talked in the last video about the landing. Some of these landings I've already rolled for them. I did a little bit out of order, but I wanted to get the rules down. You can see that there's some landing craft here with a bunch of units under it. Uh, some of these units have landed successfully. Some of these units have landed not so successfully. In fact, this one, I believe, uh, lost its landing craft, and that is why it is DG'd. The Canadians down here for the Commonwealth, uh, under this stack have taken half losses already. It's a Canadian division. Another Canadian division dropped on the beach here just fine. And you've got all these Italian coastal units. These coastal units, not only are they extremely crappy, but as soon as they get attacked, they roll to see if they surrender. So it is possible, even though it looks like a little daunting that the Allies have to sort of break out of these beach landings, it is possible that a bunch of these um, Italian coastal units just disappear um, first turn when they get attacked. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Um... Talked about the airdrops. Oh, I, I want to talk about how the landings went. So um, the landings did not go great for, for the Allies. You can see they've lost four landing craft uh, in, in landings. They lost a duck point. These are important because they can become trucks that can shuttle supply around once they get on the island. They can also be boats that sail back to get more supplies. Uh, and you can see we've lost two supply points on the initial landings, which is not great. The ports as well, the major ports on the island also have damage tracks. We roll at the beginning of the game to see how much damage has been done via airstrikes and sort of pre-invasion things. Uh, ports are all pretty damaged. Uh, most of the allied ports. I think the best one here is uh, Port Empedocle. Um, that one is probably the least damage of any of the ones the allies have access to early. But as you can see, Lycata, very damaged. Uh, this one is Marsala, very damaged. Um, so uh, the engineers and HQ units are going to have to fix those. That's going to cost supply uh, because ports are, are where supply, new supply can be shipped into. So the allies are going to need to get that up and running in an efficient way possible without burning too much time or energy doing it. A lot of challenges here. <laughs> um, and I guess the last thing I should mention is... Um, Oh, uh, going back to the uh, floating forces box. So yeah, so all of these landing craft that have landed uh, units are going to have to sail back to the floating forces box, pick up more units, bring them on. We've also got, what is this? This is 29 and three quarter supply points just sitting out here that are also going to need to be brought on in addition to what the allies can ship into ports. So the early game for the allies, they're going to have to take control of some of these ports. They're going to have to get supply shipped in. They're going to have to get units shipped in. They need to get the force. They've got some big artillery. Got some HQs that they're going to need as well because those HQs are going to be able to provide unit supply. So it's a big, it's a big job. <laughs> it's a big job, and um, they don't have a lot of time. Um, so yeah, so that's how the game begins. That's some of the strategic considerations for both sides. Some of the things that they're trying to accomplish, and you can already see that the game is asking you to problem solve, which is very cool uh, and very interesting. And how you approach those problems is going to determine how things play out. So um, the game starts midway through the Allied uh, movement phase, and the first thing we have to do is we have to do a fighter sweep against any um, uh, FW uh, German units, which are here under this unit. I'm just going to surface that so you can see it. And here's a German unit. You've got its air-to-air -air combat strength. You've got its bombardment value if it decides to aerially bomb someone. One other thing I should mention is I am playing with the optional rule for allied air refit, and normally you can refit uh, two points of air times the level of the airfield, I believe, um, or uh, two aircraft per level of the airfield. Uh, but in this particular scenario, I'm playing with the optional historical rule, which is air, allied air on these airfields can only um, refit one plane per level. So uh, when they use their air, it's going to be slower to come back. So that should provide a nice, interesting uh, situation for how they use it. Anyways, this FW-190A... That has to be fighter swept. So let's get an air mission going and I will show you how that works. Okay, air combat, very simple. Uses three dice. You roll 2d6 
um, for the attacking aircraft with some modifiers and a third D6 of a different color as you can see here, using two whites and a blue, to determine whether the aborted aircraft take hits in the combat. Couldn't be simpler. And basically, there's really only uh, one modifier, and that's the difference between uh, the aircraft. So we've got some uh, Commonwealth Spitfires flying out of Malta. They're coming after these uh, FW-190As. We're going to roll 2D6. Um, and the modifier here is uh, adding the attacker, which is plus 5, and subtracting the defender, which is 4. So we're adding a plus 1 to our 2D6 roll. We rolled, we rolled a five, that becomes a six, and a six on the table is the attacker aborts and also takes a step loss because the third die is a five. So this German, this German plane fought off these Spitfires. They've already taken a loss. It's not been a good start to the game, I'm gonna have to tell you, uh, for the Commonwealth. Well, they can do that again, and they can do it as many times as they want and have aircraft. Uh, so... Let's do it with another Spitfire. Let's see if we can get a better result. I'm beginning to think that these white dice are cursed. They're the ones where I, on the landings, rolled less than four, I think three times in a row and then two times in a row, which is why I took so many freaking losses on the landings. Uh, okay, let's try it again. That's a much better roll. That's, uh, a, that's a 12, <laughs> a modified 12 and a two, which does abort uh, the defender, but does not cause a loss. So this means the German plane is going to go under the airfield it is now done, and this uh, fighter aircraft goes back to Malta. All right, we've swept that. We also might do a sweep on the Italian aircraft up in the north just to get it, uh, just to put it under there. We've got the fighter aircraft to do it. Uh, it makes sense. And then once I do that, I will show you the airborne landings and see how those go. All right, we, uh, we've got to do all of the post-landing moves um, before we do the airdrop missions. And um, according to the, the scenario rules, um, so I'll show you here a little bit of how this is going to work because uh, it involves supply and whatnot. So we've got these units who have landed here. We've also got a stack of units who have landed here. Now, this is a four-step unit right here, so it's going to be really expensive to attack. On the landings, units can only draw supply from the landing craft that have dropped them. So, for example, this duck has come in with... Um, a point and a half of supply for these units. Now, these army rangers are only um, one-step units, so they only will require, uh, I believe, one token per step to attack. So for both of these units to attack, there'll be two tokens or half a supply point, which they have easily under here that they can draw from. They also have really high um, action rating, which is a five versus this Italian's three. So it's gonna give them some um, advances on checking for surprise, assuming this Italian unit stays in fights and um, so let's check for that now. Let's do this. Let's do this process. So these units have uh, have landed. They're allowed to use um, half of their uh, movement factors after landing, um, and so they are just going to uh, pop over here into this this hex that cost them half along that road. Now they don't quite have enough to overrun, unfortunately, because overrunning costs three. Um, so they're going to have to ch chill there and uh, wait for the combat phase. All right, so on a closer read of the rules, it does not appear that you have to do all of your movement before you do the airdrops. Um, so I may resolve those uh, first, this one and that one. But I just wanted to highlight some of the challenges facing the Allies right now. So they've landed. There's a there's an LST port under here, which will serve as the sort of ink, the base supply source for the time being. The port at Lakata is not does not have enough capacity to serve. That's going to need to get repaired. In order to get that repaired, I need to get the HQ an engineering unit from here over to the port so they can repair it. The problem is, is there's an Italian coastal defense unit in the way and not enough of these units have the ability to overrun him uh, sort of on the landing. Um, this one might, but again, it's a big division and it's gonna cost me a lot of supply underneath there to do that. And it's obviously gonna be half strength if he doesn't surrender across that river. So, and that's kind of a problem the Allies have sort of all around the map. Again, you've got these sort of larger units here against these coastal defense units and, and, you know, they do want to attack them. I put a cube here because I'm thinking about trying to overrun this guy here at Pozzalo. Um, but, uh, well, this guy's DG, so that's, that's one problem if he doesn't surrender. Uh, but um, on the other side, on the other hand, it's like there's just not a lot of supply here. The only supply that the Allies can use on the landings is supply that's still loaded on the landing craft. They have to be next to or in the hex, and there's not very much of it. So I don't want to be burning that all up here on stuff that's not going to work out. On the other hand, the Allies do need to take these ports and that supply 
essentially needs to be used here so that these landing craft can go back to the floating forces box and get more. So it's <clears throat> it feels kind of like damned if you do, damned if you don't, if you're the allies right now. There's just a lot of considerations here. You know, the units that are able to overrun these big divisions, they are uh, really expensive to fuel. And if I do that, then I may not be able to... Uh, you know, have these uh, these SAS and Marine units uh, attack in the attack phase. So there's a lot of considerations here. You know, the supply is very tight. One attack somewhere uh, may prevent another unit from attacking somewhere else. But the real key is getting the HQ uh, free of of the of this coastal unit here specifically. And I don't know if I want to wait for the attack phase for these guys to do it. I may want to spend the supply and just go for maybe an overrun. I think they can do it. I think across a river is. <clears throat> Let me just double check that. Uh, minor river for track movement is plus three, so no, that's it wouldn't be able to overrun. That would be uh, four movement points because he's in clear. Yeah, so I wouldn't be able to overrun him. So I'm gonna have to wait on that one. Um, the other thing is that uh, units can use their in what are called internal stocks if they don't have supply. The problem with that is is when you get back in supply, you're forced to replenish those internal stocks, and it's at a very bad exchange rate from supply points on the map. So you only want to do that really in an emergency. The other thing I'm considering is possibly moving these these uh, armored units, the second armored uh, division, uh, up the road here to get in, in position around these coastal defense units. So there's an interesting wrinkle with the Italian coastal defense units, and that is they're all part of a multi-unit formation, all of these guys. If this guy surrenders, they all surrender. So that could just clear the way right out. It's a two-thirds chance that they just all surrender. So I think I actually might do that. Um, I'm going to resolve this overrun here. We'll see what happens to these coastal defense units. Then I'll drop the, the airdrops. And I'll show you those. And then uh, we'll continue on and finish the movement phase for the, uh, the, the allies. Okay, I changed, my, I changed my mind down here. I'm actually not going to attack with the division. I'm going to have the uh, Royal Marines do that attack when it comes time during the combat phase. They've got artillery support from these uh, Royal Navy cruisers who are going to bombard in the bombardment phase. So they're setting up for an attack during the attack phase. <clears throat> which could actually surrender all these guys. In the meantime, I am going to do these airdrops here. So um, normally you would roll on the flak table. If the drop is inside a patrol zone, that means an enemy aircraft is active at an airfield within 10 hexes. Obviously, we um, we uh, did a fighter sweep uh, before this, so they're, they're gone. So uh, no need to roll flak. We do, however, have to roll scatter for each individual unit um, before they land and before we see if the roll is a success or not. Sorry, I'm going to pick that up. So let's start with this unit here. This is the hex that they're dropping in. We roll two dice. We look at the look at the scatter table here. Pretty standard airdrop stuff. Red, blue. That is a one and a two. That's going to send the unit, this unit, it's going to send him one and two. He's going to drop in there. Then we need to roll to see if he succeeds at that drop. And there's a table for that. Basically, there's no modifiers. He needs to roll a six or more. One of these guys is going to be a glider landing. Um, let's just make it him. He gets plus one since there's a C-47 with a glider there. I believe that modifier counts. So uh, let's see if he drops there. We need a six or higher. Yeah, that's good. He is good. He's made it. Next unit here, not a glider landing. Uh, red and blue. He scatters 6-4. That is going to be from here. Six and four. He's going to go... Uh, six and four, and he's going to drop right on those guys, which is nice. Uh, well, maybe he's going to drop on those guys. It is a friendly hex, actually, so his roll is actually not as bad. He only needs a five or more. I believe this is an open hex. Tall stack, let's see. Yeah, it's an open hex. So he needs, he needs five or more <clears throat> on this to land successfully with those guys. He got it. He's good. All right, final drop. This unit here. Let's see where he scatters to. Uh, that's going to be 5-2. So he's actually, huh, this is actually nice. So he's going to go here and then go right back to the landing hex. And because he's landing in the landing hex, he gets a plus one modifier on his uh, roll to see if he succeeds or not. So, um, air transport success. Yep. Let's roll it up. He needs a, a six or more, plus one, so really a five or more. Oh boy, he rolled a three. Um, so yeah, I believe he fails that. Uh, I think he's eliminated uh, if he fails his landing, which is unfortunate. Um, and uh, yeah, so moderately successful landing uh, for these guys. This guy may be a little bit out of... Uh, well, this, they're certainly both out of position. This guy closer to the danger than this guy who just kind of happened to land right near... <clears throat> his friends, um, airdropped units don't need supply the turn they come in, and they're also able to attack in the attack phase uh, 
uh, empty or occupied hex. If it's empty, they just get to move into it. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and do the Commonwealth landing over here, see how that goes, and then um, and then I'll be back. And obviously, uh, real quick, these uh, aircraft are done in this hex. They go back to base. I just wanted to do that before anyone points it out. All right, uh, we've, I've been taking a while to get this right, make sure I'm understanding everything. And you can see the board state has changed quite dramatically in terms of where units are last time you saw. Um, I realized as I was going through, I, I backed up some movements because I realized that the, the Commonwealth is actually in a pretty tenuous supply position. So the supply phase comes after movement. So you've got to be in supply, otherwise your units are marked out of supply. Well, the Commonwealth are in a really tough position. They, they land it, two LSTs in the landing here and here. They actually lost this LST in the landing, which was um, very bad. The only LST that landed and became a port was here on the tip of the island. And that's important because these ports, until they capture one that is has a capacity of one SP, they don't have a, a, a trace supply source, which would have been hugely problematic. Thankfully, a bunch of the Italians' coastal defense units uh, absolutely just surrendered, um, all in this sector of the island. And so the British basically freed that up without having to fire a shot. Uh, but that could have gone the other way very easily, and we would have been in serious trouble here with these units caught out of supply um, and units inter sort of interdicting the HQ um, with this this essentially makeshift port that's going on right here. So we managed to solve that. So we're all good there. We're about to enter the combat phase. Uh, you can see that the Commonwealth sent some tanks over here. They captured some supply that was left on the ground from one of the surrendering units. They captured an airfield. They've captured an airfield here. Um, and they've got the Royal Navy supporting them with some bombardments on attacks they're about to make. Um, in the reaction phase, the Italians sent some bombers from Central Italy down here to attack this destroyer stack. Um, the, the Royal Navy aircraft carrier sent an intercept mission. Both fighters aborted and got damaged, which um, pretty... Tough trade for the Commonwealth on their aircraft uh, fighters. They probably didn't want that. Uh, and then the bombers, um, after taking a hit from flak on these uh, destroyers, ended up doing a, a hit and a DG on one of the destroyers, which is good. That is what the Axis want. They want to be doing damage to these Royal Navy ships and the American ships whenever possible. Um, now, that was the brunt of the available Italian bombing force this turn, so... Um, on their turn, they're not going to have those planes. They're going to have to refit them. Uh, but I, I would say overall, a good use of Axis, uh, limited Axis air power here, putting some damage on those ships. And they're going to continue to target these ships where... Uh, ever possible. Um, it maybe was not the smartest to do it in the patrol zone of these aircraft carriers, but they were kind of sitting out here uh, just south of Augusta, so um, they felt like they would take a chance. Okay, all that said, um, we're all good in the supply phase now. The Americans you have moved up and sort of started to take control of some of these crossroads here as they get organized. Um, but I did want to point out that we're about to go into the combat phase, so I'm going to show you how combat works. I think we'll probably, this is really the only combat this one right here um, on the map for this first turn because most of the Italians have surrendered. So let's walk through this. Okay, first things first, we're doing a combat here. So obviously we're attacking this hex uh, here of these Italians. Oh, I should also mention this Italian coastal defense unit. Um, they had a full supply point that they were sitting on. They ended up uh, destroying uh, uh, that, uh, they, they ended up destroying uh, that uh, supply dump because they're concerned about um, they were concerned about possibly uh, losing it to the Americans, no reason to get extra supply, so they ended up destroying 75% of it. That does mean if this Italian unit uh, doesn't surrender, uh, that he will have to use some of his internal stocks along with what's on the map to defend at full strength. Uh, we will see. He is going to defend. Uh, he chose not to surrender. He's going down with the ship. <laughs> Um, all right, so his, um, he's DG'd, so his ratings are halved. So he's a 1.5 combat strength. He's actually a zero um, initiative, which is going to play a role here in a minute. Um, all right, so now we need to spend supply. Uh, let me get the marker that I need for this so you can see what that looks like. So when a unit doesn't have enough supply to... Um, Fund, fund its combat, uh, then it, if, if it, there's any that it can use, it takes two tokens to defend. So in this case, we get rid of this one token. And then because he is out of supply now, he's marked low. We'll just leave that off to the side here. Then we've got these uh, second SAS units. Um, okay, so they've got to spend a supply. They're spending one token per attack, and they're adjacent to a supply uh, supplied landing craft, so we'll do that. That's going to become two tokens. So a little bit of management here of the supply. There's the airfield that they captured. So there's one and a half supply points there now, along with this duck. 
in this commando unit. All right, great. So now um, the attacker's action rating is five. The defender's action rating uh, is zero <laughs> because of, or actually I, can't, I, can't, I think they can't go below one. I think he's, he's one, uh, his action rating. I, I'm mistaken there. Um, I don't think your action rating can ever go below one. So it's a five to one. So that's a four difference. Um, now we look at the terrain. I believe he is in a city. He is in a city. So that's going to be very close terrain, I believe. Uh, city, yes, very close terrain. Um, and I'm attacking across uh, a river here, uh, which is going to have his attack strength. But his attack strength is zero anyway, so uh, that's not going to matter. Okay. So it's city. Initial odds, zero to 1.5 ends up working out to be, uh, I believe, one to two. Um... You know, I'm, I'm very, I'm actually interested, hmm, interesting. Zero attack strength. Can you attack with zero attack strength? Let's find out. Okay, yeah, so um, units with a zero attack value are attack capable, so he's able to attack. Now, I'm unclear where on the combat table that would roll. Zero to 1.5, uh, ground to zero to two. I'm guessing that's one to two. Uh, Someone correct me if I'm wrong there. I'm, there's no zero column, obviously, in an odds ratio, but I'm guessing that would be one to two um, in very close terrain. So uh, then the next thing we do is um, we look at the action ratings. It is five to one. And um, now we determine if there is surprise. So when there is surprise, you need to roll 10 or more for the attacker to gain surprise. And you need, if you roll five or less, the defender gains surprise. What does surprise do? Well, surprise adds column shifts to your attack. Um, so if you get, you really want to get surprise. It is, it is essential to sort of doing attacks like this. And it's a way for you to kind of sometimes add emergent gameplay to the game, emergent moments you weren't expecting, or um, it allows you to sort of attack at odds that you wouldn't normally want to attack at if you have high action ratings like these British special forces do right now. So we roll the dice, and we roll three at once. Two of them are going to be the surprise value. Um, we're looking for 10 or more. We are getting plus four on the roll. So we just need to roll a, uh, a six or better on those two dice. Uh, and then we'll see how many column shifts we get. And we rolled seven, so we do get surprise. Seven plus four is 11. We get three column shifts. So we are in the three to one, uh, three to one very close column. So now we're going to roll are uh, these these British these British SAS surprise these Italian coastal defense units um, here coming across that bridge into the city of Augusta um, and now we uh, roll the dice and uh, the, there's a DRM on this roll which is the difference between the action ratings so in addition to making surprise more likely the British SAS are really good in combat so they're also going to get a plus four uh, on this roll and they're rolling on the three to one very close if I'm doing this properly it's been a while they rolled a five plus four is a nine. That's an attacker option one, defender option one. So that means starting with the attacker, um, they have to decide whether they're gonna take a hit or retreat. And obviously they don't want to uh, retreat. So the SAS is gonna take a hit. That's gonna wipe them out. However, now the defender is forced to take their option. And that means they either have to retreat or take a step loss. Um, well, they are going to go next. The Axis is going to go next. So they're going to they're gonna retreat um, because there's no sense in losing the unit, although they don't really have supply, but that's okay. Uh, there's no sense in losing the unit. They, they did a hit on the SAS, and uh, that's a pretty good trade for the Axis players. Um, the next thing that's going to happen here is, uh, as far as attacks go, is that the all the airborne units that are on the map uh, who dropped this turn can attack at no cost, and that essentially just moves them into a hex. So the first airborne is gonna is gonna come up here, and we're gonna do the same over here with the American airborne. I'll do that off camera. But as you can see, that's how attacking works. That's sort of the attack procedure. You do it a couple of times, it gets really fast. Uh, but I wanted to show you the different steps on how to do it. And I just realized I did something kind of dumb. <laughs> um, there's absolutely no reason why the the third commando unit could not have made that attack as well. And the reason that that would have been smart is had I got a result like I just did, which was um, uh, an attacker option that they have to take. Um, these, uh, the unit that was still here as part of the attack, uh, could have advanced and taken the city. So we're going to say I did that. I'm learning as I go here. I know it's a dumb noob mistake here, but realistically what should have happened is both of these special forces units, uh, should have attacked together, which would have been another token out of here, um, when they did that. 
and that would have meant that even though the SAS unit took a hit, uh, when this guy retreated, he was allowed to advance into this hex. So uh, we're going to say I did that. I'm learning as I go. I'm trying to get back into the OCS rhythm of things. And that's a much smarter idea because that allows them to take the port of Syracuse, which, as you can see, has a uh, port capacity right now of three tokens. If we can get that up to uh, repair that up one level, then uh, we'll be able to uh, use it as a uh, trace supply source and we'll also be able to ship more stuff into it. So that is what I am going to do there. And uh, we are going to shift over now, probably to the end of the turn for the allies, uh, do some cleanup, and then um, it'll be the Axis turn. Last correction, I promise, I promise. I did get a couple things, a couple details wrong after a quick rules check, after thinking about this for a bit. Okay, first things first. Action ratings can go below one. They can actually go below zero. So the action rating difference between these two units was five. That means that the they still got surprised. That was that does not change. What it does mean is that the 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 uh, the roll um, was added was plus five to the combat roll, not plus four. Additionally, uh, the rule says that when a unit uh, when a odds ratio is below the field below the minimum or maximum of the combat table, you use the the row that is on the table closest. So for example, in this case, it was a zero versus a two. That would obviously be the max lowest table. So it was a one to three attack. So we were a column down, but a DRM up. What does that mean? Did I do this wrong? Well, what it means is that the outcome of this particular combat with the corrections was an AO1, DO1. So the exact same result that we got. And I, that is a, a one quick thing about this system that I should mention is that the combat table uh, relatively flat when it comes to results. So what I originally calculated was here. What we actually got was here. As you can see, same thing. If you make a mistake on this, it's not usually too big a deal. When you correct it, you usually get the same result. It's uh, it's not a huge deal if you mess this up. So if you're playing solo or you're playing face-to-face -face and you find out later that you messed up a combat result, don't worry about it too much. The table's super flat. Um, it'll work out in the end, law of averages and so forth. All right, back to it. I've done it correctly this time, um, unless I haven't, in which case you need to let me know, uh, and away we go. Heading into turn one for the Axis, finally. Um, and, uh, you know, they've got a lot of considerations here. I'm probably not going to do the updates as frequently as I have been. It's been helpful for me to talk through some of the procedures with, with the system as I relearn it. And obviously, if you've never played OCS, seeing how the, the thought process w plays out in OCS, how the game requires you to think, asks you to think, which I think is sort of the most interesting part of the system. So I won't do that I'm moving forward, but I did want to just touch on some of the Axis considerations here now that I finished the Allies' first turn and, you know, there's a lot going on with the landings and what have you. Um, but there's a couple of choices the Axes, well, more than a couple, uh, choices the Axes have to make here about where they set up their defensive positions. You know, this uh, this line up through here is mm, rather undefended, and the Americans are going to start moving that way pretty quickly. Germans have more units here. They may want to shift those guys, but they have to be careful because this railroad line here is how they're going to, the, the Axis are going to sort of trace supply or be able to move laterally across the map if this gets blocked or cut. They're kind of, you know, separated into two groups and they don't want to have that if they can. Obviously, the Commonwealth is going to drive up here. They're going to try and take Catania. And if they do, I mean, they don't even have to take Catania to cut the rail line here. And if that's the case, then we're talking about, you know, trace supply being traced back up this way with the Americans coming around. So they don't want to get stuck in the middle here because that means they'll all be caught out of supply at some point potentially. Um, so they may want to move, but they don't want to leave it too open either. They've got units down here. They've got units here. And they may, they may have the strength to hang out for, you know, another couple of turns. But they do have to get an eye going about how they're going to get back up towards this direction. And the same is maybe true over here as well. Now they do have up here, you can see, they do have the um, Fallschirm Jaeger uh, reinforcements coming in this turn. They're probably gonna be transported by air. They've got another reinforcement here that could come in via shipping. Uh, and then they got a bunch of aircraft this turn, as you can see, the German air forces and the Italian air forces are a lot more numerous. They've refit a lot of the aircraft at their air bases uh, here. You know, they've got patrol zones up now here. Now, the one thing that the allies did do um, at the end of their turn in their exploitation phase is they sent a huge wave of bombers here to bomb some of these airfields. And they actually did a bunch of hits to the aircraft here. Uh, and they did some hits to the aircraft over here as well. Uh, but, the, you know, the air, it, it's not going to be so undefended moving forward uh, if the Axis play it smartly. So the Allies are really going to have to take out that air, the air forces where they can. 
and they're going to have to get moving. And so the Axis is going to have to deal with all of that. The Axis, the other problem that they have is that the supply that comes in from this box that gets shipped in, they're only allowed four supply points a turn. And that's to a port somewhere along here or over here. And that means that any supply that lands at that port, you know, if it wants to, if these units want to use it, it's got to be hauled in by the trucks or the, or the wagons that are in some of these stacks. And that's going to be laborious and tedious. And, um, you know, they have, you know, the Axis have... Um, the, a lot of forces, but that also means a lot of forces that require that supply. They've got this really big artillery unit here who can drop, you know, some bombs on approaching allied units, but not if it can't get to some supply. So um, there's there's kind of a puzzle to figure out here about how best to slow down the allies as they come forward. You know, a lot of these units out here are kind of out in no man's land right now. Um, and the supply situation, you know, if the, the Axis starts sending supplies this way and suddenly these units are taken out, then they're leaving supply for the Allies to capture. If they leave it back here. That sort of drastically reduces the operational ability of, of uh, you know, these forces in the center of the island. You know, they don't have a ton of supply. I mean, they've got some. This one, I think, is sort of in the best position. I think they have five supply points. Two supply points. No, that's not a great supply situation. I think these guys have five supply points. But, you know, if they want to be using this artillery to barrage, if they want to be defending a lot, you know, they're going to have to get some more supply moved forward. So where they choose to drop it is going to be uh, a huge consideration. And they can't ignore the Commonwealth either. There's a massive number of forces coming up here. And while there are more defensible positions, especially around this coast road near Mount Etna, um, you know, they, they also have to divert supply over here. So uh, it's going to be a real tight, uh, tight uh, calculation for them to make. And uh, looking forward to trying to figure that one out. Well, one of the things the Axis accomplished this turn was destroying this U.S. cruiser group, which is uh, pretty spectacular for them. Uh, that's a huge blow to the Axis and one of the, or excuse me, the Allies. And one of the main mistakes that the Allies have made here is that they didn't actually get any aircraft forward um, or to any of these air bases. And even if they did, these groups kind of moved out a little bit ahead of their air cover thinking that they were going to be able next turn to um, land some units in here with more success. Unfortunately, the Axis spotted that and absolutely just wiped this U.S. cruiser. It's a little embarrassing on my part for letting that happen, but hey, that's, th that's what happens when you learn the ropes. This cruiser goes down, that's VP for the Axis on the hoof. Huge deal. All right, to finish up this video, a little summary of where we're at after both the Axis and the Allies have had a full turn here in Sicily. Uh, let's start down here with the Commonwealth. They are... Um, doing pretty good. Um, they have cleared out a bunch of the coastal defenses. You know, there's some defenders up in these mountains. Uh, there's like a Commonwealth stack here, unfortunately, that got bombed with artillery this turn. They got barraged. Going to be interesting to see if the Americans come this way to try and sweep these up. Uh, there's a pretty big German force here that the Americans have to kind of get through if they want to go this way. I'm not sure that they do. We'll find out on their next turn. But in general, the Commonwealth is pretty well situated to move up basically all the way. They're, they're probably going to capture Augusta this turn, um, and they're pretty well situated to get at least up to the um, uh, Lentini River here. Uh, the Germans obviously took up a defensive position, and the Italians, as you can see, a defensive position here. Uh, there were air in all of these stacks, but uh, in the reaction phase, the Allies did a bunch of fighter sweeps. They actually did a bombing run on this airfield. They unfortunately missed, but they did manage to um, abort most of the ready aircraft that the Germans had there, so uh, this is all open again to uh, to air attack once more on the Allies' turn when they refit. The uh, British carriers here, um, there was a fighter sweep brought down by the Germans from um, Regium uh, up there. And uh, they did manage to uh, abort a couple of the aircraft uh, units that were stationed out at sea. Those are going to refit for free this turn. They were trying to do a loss to them. They actually did do a hit on Indomitable's fighter squadron. Uh, so they're at reduced strength. Um, but really, the targets now uh, on the next turn coming up, the Commonwealth, they want to move as many of these units forward as they can. They want to get this HQ, because they don't have any engineers. They want to get this HQ into Syracuse as quickly as possible. And they want to try and be able to start repairing that port so they can bring in more supply there, because they are going to need it. Uh, there's a lot of attack ready units and mobile units that are going to consume supply doing these moves and they're going to want to push up against here the one thing the axis does need to be careful about the the ducks the the british ducks have converted to trucks they're carrying supply they're probably going to unload those and then they can load some of these british special forces and these airborne units uh, and then take off around and drop try and drop them again um, in 
uh, in some of these hexes here and behind, which would be uh, not good for the Germans. Uh, so we'll see how that pans out. That's something that they're going to definitely want to consider. Um, the other thing is that the Commonwealth do have to drop uh, more of the first airborne next turn. They are forced to do that. Um, the Americans as well with the 82nd. Um, and so those airborne drops could be as far forward um, as up here somewhere behind the river line. Uh, Axis, again, have to be worried about that. The other thing they got to be worried about is this division here. This division took a hit in order to make a breakdown unit so they could spot for the artillery barrage on these armor units. That was a good choice. Um, these guys are now blocking this mountain road where it's possible that the British might come up and try and cut these guys out of trace supply, uh, which would be um, really sort of dreadful for all of these units getting stuck here. Um, if the British can own this road, then suddenly this whole pocket is going to kind of collapse. So that's where the Commonwealth stand. The Allies on this side, the Americans, um, they've got a lot of work to do. They by far have the most units they need to bring in next turn. There's not a ton of landing craft points here, um, but they do want to get the second armored in um, as quickly as possible because that's a big formation that's going to be the, th the main thrust. And they do want to get this supply brought in as quickly as possible as well. So they're not going to be able to do it all on this turn, but um, it should be a, a pretty good reinforcement for them, um, especially if they're able to make this, um, this uh, coastal unit here surrender. If they're able to do that, they could drop units as potentially as far forward as these destroyers, which was my original plan and why they were so vulnerable. But I wanted to get as many units up the coast as quickly as possible. So uh, that's something hopefully we, these guys will surrender and that's something that we will look at. Um, the Germans did do a little bit of aggressive movement here through the hills. They did move up to block this approach um, uh, up this way, um, where the Americans, part of the second armor was threatening the, uh, this whole division here for the Germans, they were sort of back at this supply uh, depot. They decided they were going to move west because there wasn't a lot of force here on these highways and they felt like they needed to protect these rail lines, uh, this rail line and these uh, roads up to the north so that the Americans couldn't get there. Uh, goal for the Americans this turn is they want to break through a bunch of this stuff and they're going to need to, uh, I, I want them to get at least halfway up this road towards uh, the port at Palermo. Um, they only have three turns left in order to get there uh, and it's going to be absolutely critical that they do that. A smaller detachment or some landings are going to come this way against these Italian coastal units who don't offer much resistance. The problem is is that there's um, German aircraft in here so we are, after we refit all of these air forces we are going to have to um, do some fighter sweeps on them. We've been actually doing pretty good the Allies with uh, fighter sweeps. We've been aborting a lot of aircraft, doing damage to the German and Italian air forces um, so if we can keep that up, we're great. The other thing, the Americans, they're going to have to repair this port at Lycata. That's going to cost some supply to do that, but that will make Lycata um, a, a trace supply location, which is, is going to be very important as this coastal advance happens. And... Um, and uh, that will let them get more supply and ship more supply in there. The Americans are going to be able to ship eight free supply from Tunisia, essentially, uh, to the map, which is going to uh, greatly bolster their ability to get some offensive operations going. So it does look a little static right now. You can see that the Commonwealth has sort of made more of a foothold, but uh, that's going to change very rapidly on the, uh, on the, on the turn uh, for the uh, Allies. And in fact, while we're looking at this, uh, let's see uh, who's going first next turn, who gets the initiative while we're talking about this. We roll a die for each side. Uh, the blue is the uh, axis, the red is the allies, and that is a tied roll. I don't know what happens in a tied roll for initiative. Let me look at that real fast. All right, the answer is ties get re-rolled, so let's try that again. Initiative next turn, going to the allies. Now they have a choice to make. Do they want to go first and potentially give the Germans a, a double turn on the next turn, or do they want the Germans to go first here? Hmm... I think they're probably going to have the make the Germans go first just because uh, the Allies are not really in a position to exploit the position they're in immediately. And if they can threaten a double turn next turn, that could make great headway uh, heading that way and heading this way. So, uh, yeah, Germans will be up. Axis will be up. Um, they, you know, have been holding a defensive position, so they probably don't have a ton to do on this turn. And uh, we'll see how it goes.